before I start my lecture, I also uh, want to say a word on a personal note uh, concerning uh, Uriel Head. I missed Uriel Head by about two years when I came to Jerusalem in 1970. But the late Gabriel Baer, who was uh, my professor, uh, was very fast to fill me in on Uriel Head's uh, boundless admiration of the Bursa court record. The rest is personal history for me, as Amnon Cohen said yesterday. So Head had a, deci had a decisive role in my own academic life. Uh, Amy, just last sentence, Amy talked about uh, Will Head in terms, somewhere, I don't remember, uh, in terms of uh, a former generation, innocence, and um, well, suffering was some naivete. I don't know if suffering is the word. I admit that uh, something of this uh, rubbed on me too, uh, but I hope not too much. It will become clear from my lecture. Not my lecture. The job I've taken upon myself here is to discuss anew some major questions from the history of law in the Ottoman Empire. <coughs> Usually these are problems that have been discussed many times, but it seems to be, seem to be it as yet controversial, hence deserving of more thought, certainly more research. What justify, justifies my approach, I think, is that I draw materials and insights from a new source, which is the Shikayet Register of 1675, uh, called the Vienna Book of Complaints. Just a quick note of explanation. This volume of complaints fell to the hands of the Austrian army in one of the Ottoman-Austrian wars of the period when the Ottomans suffered a particularly bad defeat and were forced to retreat leaving all their equipment behind and published in a facsimile form in 1984. The Shikayet is strictly speaking not a book on Ottoman law or Islamic law, but it happens entirely by chance to skirt those topics unintentionally, as I said, and what is particularly endearing in it, to my eyes, it supplies insights that the Qadi Sijils do not have. I do not have the time in this short lecture to enter into all the sides of the methodology of the Shikayet, but some points I cannot leave aside. One is the idea often one hears in connection with complaints literature that it should not be treated like a straightforward historical source, since it may have been in fact invited by the government in order to enhance the legitimacy, the legitimacy of the ruler in the eyes of the populace. I do not think that this argument works for this source. All those complaints, for example, mention nine people and exact addresses and cannot possibly be literary products many more arguments in the extended version of my paper. Passing to the documents themselves, a large part of the complaints in the volume, which consists of some 3,000 complaints, revolve around private affairs of indiv individuals against other private persons. A, a, in a very few cases, in the, is the reference to dissatisfaction with the decision of the Qadi. So I can say very shortly, this is not my topic today, uh, there is no appeal in the register. What very often there is, is an argument by the complaint, complainants uh, that the Qadi decision was disregarded by, other, by the other party, either because that party was strong enough socially or sometimes managed to disappear. Another large, large group of complaints are grievances of officials against other officials for causing them damage 
by hindering them from enjoying their right in enjoying a service to which they had been nominated, state service, I mean. Yet another important group of complaints has to do with the grievances of individuals against officials for causing them wrongs in a variety of ways, most commonly by wrestling economic rights from them without justice and without proper legal process. There is much to be learned from these cases too, but my, my main interest in this paper is with another topic. This is a large group of documents, probably close to a, close to a hundred, that are communal complaints of commoners, usually villagers, against provincial governments, governors of various ranks, usually the lowest, but not only, for staging an event of major tax extortion, usually accompanied by additional abuses, uh, some of them quite pernicious. The tax extortion was typically ca carried out uh, through a devil, the Arabic Dao, a tour of a province made by a group of soldiers who came to a village and settled in the houses of the Raya, the simple people, the Raya, uh, for a number of days, insulting, sometimes beating up the families of those Raya, sometimes driving out and banishing the Raya to other provinces for a period of time, days, maybe months. Uh, the question is, what kind of legal insights can be extracted uh, from these documents? As an introduction to this point, I want to say in general that my major preoccupation in Ottoman Islamic law is trying, always been trying to figure out the quality of justice supplied by the Ottoman Qadi, grosso modo, in any way, generally. When I started my long road of studying Ottoman sigils and Ottoman law, I was quite enthusiastic in joining Ronald Jennings, particularly, in affirm, affirming that the Qadi's justice was a sort of rule of law to a much higher level than was thought of for generations, possibly centuries, evidently centuries. In the, in the recent years, this optimism hit some hard times. But I am sure, talk about this, but I am sure that uh, the jury is still out on the final verdict on this discussion. In any event, in recent years, I read again the Shikayet Defteri. I did read it already in 1994 from my book on Ottoman law, but foolishly, it was mentioned, but was foolishly, I might add, uh, overlooked the fact that the complaints were a gold mine of legal history. And on reading the complaints recently, I noticed that there is in it also interesting hints on the quality of justice supplied by the Ottoman uh, Qadi that I didn't pay attention to before. The first point that I can see is astonishing. In the communal complaints that I mentioned above is that while the reference to villages is evident in many cases, in close to a hundred cases, the whole population of the Kaza uh, is mentioned as complaining. A fact that I ignored totally in the past. I have some documentation on the Kaza of Bursa in 1695. The topic, of course, has not been studied at all. And judging by it, it's a survey, it's not just hints. As judging by it, a, a casa might mean, according to the case of Bursa, a population of about 3,000 people. I'll take this as a rule of thumb uh, for what I'm saying. And I, I, what I want to say is this, if there were some just 50 complaints like this, I think there were more, as I said, the reference is to some 150,000 people who made the complaint altogether, not just the 3,000 that appear on the roll call of the, the Shikayet, but in fact, inside, there are 150,000 complainants. And this gives, I think, a whole new meaning to the number of complainants in the register, and the, the meaning of the whole document. But what is the importance of this, beyond the number? 
Uh, in many of the cases, this large group of people did not send a, the petition with a messenger to Istanbul, as they could, legally, practically, but went to the Sharia court and complained to the Qadi, expecting him to forward the, the complaint to the center, which he did always. Furthermore, more often than not, inside the complaint, the Rehaya asked the Sultan to send the order. <coughs> All the complaints are, in fact, in the book, are not really complaints, but orders after the complaint. They asked the Sultan to send the order to their Qadi and direct him to investigate the case and bring people to justice if need be. To emphasize here, nobody ever in the, this register asked to be judged by a provincial governor, not even once in the whole register. Also, there is no sign or a hint that any complaint started life with a complaint presented to a governor. I found one case of a governor who presented a petition himself against robbers, but he expressly, expressly demanded the involvement of the Sharia court in the case, saying he couldn't do it alone. And to emphasize, this was not a register devoted to Qadis and the work. It was a public forum and everyone got his spot in the sun, so to speak, if he presented a petition. But while Cadiz got it in profusion, nobody else did. I think the conclusion is called for that the large number of people who approached the Cadiz and asked for his intervention in the case is a major vote of confidence in favor of the Cadiz, coming as it did from people who could not be fooled in the matter. Moreover, in many of these complaints, the content itself make us, makes it similar, makes a similar point in that the officials are criticized, official, not Cadiz, but secular officials, uh, for using harsh and false legal processes instead of proper ones, all forming parts of the proper Sharia. This information generally tallies with opinions by scholar of the uh, former generation, I should call them Jennings, Gerber, myself, yes, uh, and Marcus, express already in the 1970 and 19, uh, two, 1990s. In this case, an opposition appeared in more recent years in the form of new studies that criticized the old school alleging that the conclusion about the justice and fairness of the Ottoman Qadi was naive and mistaken and was not confirmed by new studies that showed that court outcomes in several places in Ottoman Anatolia ended up in favor of members of the social elite by a very big margin. These studies pioneered by some Turkish scholars Julia John Bakal and Boac Argene uh, in particular. Uh, recently, uh, these studies recently got a serious boost from a book by Argene and Josh Gell, uh, if somebody knows it's a new book, which used computer and mathematical models to reach a conclusion which was basically the same. The elite in the northeastern town of Kastamonu, Kastamonu which they studied, won over Raya by a large margin. In addition, they also supplied an explanation as to why this was so. Needless to say, I say, the reason was not that those who won had two witnesses to support the case. Those who won, in fact, they say, made use of four tricks which apparently had a magical influence over the Qadi. Against the letter, and the self-proclaimed spirit of Islamic law, traditional and Ottoman. These tricks were, I'm really summarizing the book uh, very ferociously, uh, these were sizing the position of plaintiff, uh, which apparently had a crucial advantage in trials. And second, the ability to secure a fatwa and presenting it in, in a court. And third, 
the ability to secure written documents to bolster the case, and fourth, the ability to use a representative appeal in court, the kill. The case is, of course, merely statistical, and I, for one, remain unconvinced. I want to say that I have seen hundreds, if not thousands, I'm sure thousands, of court cases in 17th century Bursa and elsewhere also, uh, where all these legal devices were used, and I read all of these cases carefully, to affirm whether the basis of the Cadiz decision were flimsy or solid and according to rules set by the Sharia itself, not tricks by the rules set by the Sharia, which are, in fact, only three and uh, all of them crystal clear. One is admission of the case of your opponent. The second is oath, in case no party has a proof. And third, a proof, Baina, Baina. Uh, there is two witnesses supporting your case. I never saw a case that ended, ended on other grounds at all. Not even one of us may end. My conclusion is affirmed that the Cadi was fair in a general way. I say a general way because some Cadis were also uh, rotten apples, especially knives, some knives were. In, in, the, in the document itself found to be corrupt. I do believe that members of the elite were richer, richer and more educated and could secure also these devices, which of course were helpful to a certain extent if you had the basic proof. But there is a great distance between this to the assumption that the Qadi was systematically biased. I also want here to emphasize that the assumption of Jambakar and Regene, uh, Gel, uh, seems to be that, uh, which is related to the argument, seems to be that uh, there was some sort of symbiotic cooperation uh, between ulema and askeris in Ottoman society, uh, maybe even a kind of friendship between the two groups. In fact, uh, in my opinion, such friendship never existed at the time we're talking about, 17th, 18th century, probably always. Uh, the Shikayat Register is again a very good source on this. Again, the topic I was never uh, really researched. Uh, uh, in any case, to go back to the Shikayat, uh, the, the, uh, I, before I go back to the Shikayat, I must emphasize, of course, that the Kadi Sijil is uh, completely mute on the question. In the Shikayat, in any way, we not rarely observe that Kadis are subject of oppression and molestation at the end of governors, along with their ayah, whom they often are trying to defend, Qadis were not merely banished to other places in, in, with their ayah uh, and molested in other ways. Sometimes ulema are among those launching complaints against Askeris. These findings are in complete agreement with the views, again, Jennings and Marcus and myself uh, from 17th century Bursa, and I thank you.